when it went up into the sky, it was something I had never seen before. And I had the feeling it was not of this world. Hi, good morning. Hi, Bob. How are you? Although we've looked at other UFO trace evidence cases, Bob's is different. He says he has an actual piece of a UFO that he discovered after an amazing encounter in 1985. Bob, could you tell us how you came into possession sure. of this unique looking object? I was in Grand Junction, Colorado, between uh, Grand Junction and Cisco, Utah, and it was late at night, and uh, the lady friend and I were driving. We saw this light up ahead. This was a huge light. It was about the size of a three-story building. But she turned the headlights on me, and when she did, this thing just shot up in the air like that, just as fast as my eyes could follow it. And it connected to two other lights, like two blue neon tubular lights, one on top of the other, with a space in between. And when it hit this, it just shot out of sight. But before it did, I saw kind of a little explosion light. This thing came back down toward me. There was a groove in the ground, and I followed the groove in the ground until I saw this thing lying there, and it was still glowing hot. So after Bob sees this object, he heads out to where he thought the piece had landed, and he sees this groove in the ground, as if this piece came down at a high velocity and skidded to a stop. Now this is the first time I've heard a story like this, and the fact that he not only found this piece, but has it to show, is amazing. So Dr. Gibbons, have you done any work yourself on this? Yes, I have. Dr. Robert Gibbons is a physicist who's formerly worked at NASA, Northrop Grumman, and Hughes Aircraft. He served in the U.S. Army for over 20 years, and his entire experience, he's never encountered anything quite like the Bob White object. In the year 2000, he joined Bob White's team to determine once and for all what this object really is. So we went to Laughlin, Nevada, and during that time, the object affected the batteries in the wall safe at the hotel three days in a row. The batteries had died and were broken open the first day. People from the hotel had to come up and put on an electronic meter to open the safe. The meter said the safe is open, yet it was not. So the first night they had to drill it. This happened two more nights in a row. There must be some effect coming from the object, some kind of radiation or something causing those batteries to go dead. Whatever caused this safe to malfunction, it was obviously not an isolated incident. So to determine if it was some kind of x-ray or gamma ray, Dr. Gibbons set up a test utilizing dental x-ray film and the Bob White object. I made a cylinder. We put a, a film, unexposed film at the top, unexposed film at the bottom, and then we had uh, facing in on the cylinder films. And we came up with a really, really interesting conclusion. These are the actual dental x-ray films. The one of importance is the one with the two black spots. Right. So you're saying you held the object up to actually, x-ray... Actually, this sat on the film for 48 hours. And during that time, something exposed the film, not just fogged it, but put two distinct spots which match up with the two lobes, if you will, of the object. It looks like the object has two distinct lobes, as Dr. Gibbons calls them. And in this x-ray test, when you line up the film with the object, the two lobes match up almost perfectly with the exposure on the film. So something is emitting from the object that causes the film to expose. But what this is and the reason for this, it's still undetermined. Well, what about scientists? What, what have they said about this? The first thing I did was send it to New Mexico Tech and Dr. And he said, had I known the story on this, I would have suggested that you do isotope ratio abundance tests mm -hmm. on it because he said, we don't have the equipment here to, to perform these tests. An isotopic ratio abundance test measures the amount of isotopes in a given element. Different elements like chromium, titanium, and strontium have a range of isotopes in their composition. But formed in a different or even alien environment, these ratios could be different. I had uh, contacts to go to uh, Los Alamos, and there I met uh, uh, 
uh, who is the uh, top uh, metallurgist, and Dr. who they called in on special occasions. And he was really excited about this because he'd never seen anything like it before. He said to me, uh, this is something that I've been looking for all my life. He said, this is definitely extraterrestrial. Now we have a report from Los Alamos. They said they did the analysis on silicon. I called Dr. and I asked him about it. He said, aluminum, aluminum. And I'm saying, why does he keep telling, why does he keep talking about aluminum? The report says you did it in uh, on silicon. He said, well, we'll have to talk to did it. So I called and said, isotopes? No, we didn't do any isotopes tests at all. Although Los Alamos was supposed to do this isotopic ratio abundance test, they denied that they did. So were you getting the feeling that all these scientists that were doing the analysis were, were lying to you? Absolutely lying to me. We have a piece that may have fallen off of a UFO. We know that it affected a wall safe and caused it to malfunction three nights in a row. And although there have been multiple labs and analysts that have looked at this object, Bob claims that they're scared to talk about it after their tests. But we've contacted two scientists who are brave enough to talk to us and analyze the Bob White object. My initial impression of the object was that it was extremely extraordinary. Um, it was something like which I'd never seen before. Chris Ellis is a solid state physicist with an expertise focusing on aluminum alloys and semiconductors. After poring over the data, we found that the object is an aluminum alloy of unknown origin. This is not anything like we've seen before. There are some very unusual uh, metals in this object that you typically do not find in other alloys. What's the chance that these elements would end up in this alloy either naturally or accidentally? I'd have to say pretty much zero. So this is absolutely a, a manufactured object. Looking at a detailed list of all the metals and all the um, elements that can be found in this object, it's conclusive that they're there by purpose. This looks like a manufactured piece created by some form of intelligence. Now, could it be made by us or could it have been made by an extraterrestrial? We're looking at something much more advanced than what we're currently familiar with today. We are in Kimberling City, Missouri, investigating the Bob White story. In 1985, after seeing multiple UFOs, an object is either ejected or shot down towards the ground. Through scrupulous scientific analysis, no one can say what this piece actually is. We are now sitting down with two scientists who are brave enough to come out and speak to us. And even though the institutions they're affiliated with requested to remain anonymous, we are uncovering new clues that are being discovered about Bob White's object. I did two types of tests. The first test I did was an X-ray diffraction analysis. David Lamb is a research scientist currently at a major university in the U.S. His expertise is in physics and material science, and he spent the past year researching the Bob White object. What's very unique about this is we have what's called an amorphous peak here. And that amorphous peak tells me that this is a polycrystalline semiconductor. What's the significance of that? I mean, how, how anomalous is that? You don't find that in aircraft aluminum. Where do you find it? I'm not aware you find it anywhere. Another thing that's very unusual in this is it has silver in it, and a very high percentage of silver, um, about 4.3% silver. Silver is only used in aluminum at the experimental stage of superconductivity. If you spray the surface of aluminum with silver, then you enhance superconductivity. Superconductivity is a phenomenon in some metals that occurs at very low temperatures, resulting in absolutely zero electrical resistance and excludes the interior magnetic field. This means that an electric current introduced to the superconductor can flow and persist freely and indefinitely without any added power source. Let's say you fire a, a, a bullet through a magnetic field, well, it's going to have experienced drag. But what if that bullet was able to superconduct it? It would expel the magnetic field and that bullet would not slow down. It would not experience any kind of drag. So, 
if this was something traveling through space and it was going through, let's say, Jupiter's powerful magnetic field, it's, it could theoretically expel that magnetic field and zip past Jupiter without experiencing those forces. Now, with superconductivity, is that difficult to achieve? Space is the perfect environment for superconductivity. You have to expend no energy to get objects to be superconductive in space. So if an object were fabricated to travel in space on its own, this would be the kind of object it would be? Yes. You're going to get the biggest bang for your buck out of the native properties of this object in space. It's a perfect fit. Let's put the pieces together. Bob White's object reminds me of other cases we've investigated in the past. Maury Island, where a witness said metal objects were ejected from a UFO. I took a little sample from the serrated edge of this aluminum piece. Most of the material you can identify. You know, it's a question of whether it's anomalous or whether it's normal. Aurora, Texas, where Brawley Oates gave us an unknown aluminum alloy discovered at a mysterious crash site. Right away we could tell this was aluminum. Uh, that's the highest peak. So what's that one, that larger peak? Could we have uh, picked up contaminants from the soil? Even if we did, it should correspond to some element that we could match here. That's interesting. I hope maybe we discovered a brand new element. What do all these things have in common? These objects have unique qualities that might point to an extraterrestrial origin. So we've had three trace evidence cases that we've looked at and each time I get excited that we're going to come up with some kind of evidence that proves what we're dealing with is not of this earth. But every time, I'm disappointed. I think the evidence is absolutely overwhelming going all the way back to the 1930s, running right through for 70 years, there's a collection of trace evidence that is astounding. The problem is it's absolutely proving without a shadow of a doubt that that trace evidence is causally connected to the high strangers that people experience. I think the wall between what we have now and where we want to be for absolute proof is tissue paper thin. We must keep going the answer is on the other side of that wall. We've investigated Bucks County and heard amazing testimony. And we corroborated the stories of eyewitnesses to an amazing craft. Although we had no idea what to think of these sparkles that Denise Murder described, I think we've shown with a preponderance of evidence what these UFOs are up to. After hearing the cases in Poland of this vitrified soil, possibly connected to these unidentified holes. We think they might be testing us, but for what reason, we don't know. Then we hear the story of Bob White and actually hold the object in our hands, and we read the reports from top-level institutions that can't identify it. It's fantastic, and as time passes, further scientific testing may one day prove that it's of extraterrestrial origin. I'm not alone in thinking that trace evidence may be the key to discovering what's behind these UFOs. It's just a matter of time before we discover that smoking gun that will blow this secret wide open. Let's go. We just received a phone call from David Lamb. After conducting additional scientific testing, he now theorizes that Bob White's object is a quasi-crystal of a very complex structure. This type of structure is considered to be the cutting edge of nanotechnology. It didn't exist in 1985, and even today, it's in its early stages of development. I believe, as science and technology progress, it will one day be possible to properly identify the nature of Bob White's object and prove once and for all it's extraterrestrial.